All right. <clears throat> so let's get back to our discussion of ligaments. We started ligaments of the kind of ligaments around the SI joint. So let's get into the uh, we looked at them yesterday in lab and I know some of you haven't had lab yet. Uh, but now we're going to get a little further into the weeds on these things. So let's talk about the anterior sacroiliac ligament. Uh, it how it lightly binds the sacrum to the ilium. It's not super strong. It's not like the interosseous sacroiliac ligaments. It provides very little support to the SI joint. It's not a supportive ligament. Um, it does fortify the anterior capsule. We said the SI joint was weird because it had a capsule on the front to hold the synovial fluid in, uh, but it has no capsule on the back. Remember what acts as the capsule in the back? Interosseous sacroiliac ligaments do. So that capsule on the front is really thin. Uh, so the anterior sacroiliac ligament, one of its most important jobs is to fortify and make that, that capsule stronger so you don't want to spring a leak in that capsule and synovial fluid to drain out. There's a cartoon of the anterior sacroiliac ligament right there. Okay. In reality, you see the author just drew it kind of like that. In reality, there are superior middle and inferior fibers that run in different directions of type 1 collagen. Pretty strong stuff, um, but not super important, kind of a too far in the weeds, I think I don't think boards would ask that question. All right, this is our picture from lab yesterday, and we can see again the anterior sacroiliac ligament uh, living right here, and it's covered by uh, this. So that was the remember ilium to lumbar, iliolumbar ligament. These were the vertical fibers and the inferior fibers. So it's those are over the top of this anterior sacroiliac ligament. All right, so that's enough about that. Now we get into this quite controversial and complicated. Anatomists have dissected probably thousands and thousands of cadavers, and they still can't completely pin, pin the anatomy of this ligament down. Um, it's the iliolumbar ligament. So, very complex anatomy. It has many fibers running in different directions. Um, Bogue Duke, who is the, the leading authority on this, uh, breaks it down like this. Um, he says there's a vertical, which we looked at yesterday, iliolumbar ligament, or vertical fibers of the iliolumbar ligament. There's inferior iliolumbar ligament fibers, uh, and then there are more superiorly, there's an anterior and posterior iliolumbar ligament. Kramer calls these like they used to a long time ago. They didn't recognize that these were, were two, two divisions. Uh, Kramer just calls those the superior iliolumbar ligament, and Bogduk says that doesn't exist. They're definitely distinct, uh, distinct fibers, as we'll see here in a second. Um, and here's another picture from our lab yesterday. Uh, and you can see the iliolumbar ligament, the inferior portion of it. We have the the vertical running iliolumbar ligament here, and then we have the inferior iliolumbar ligament running more, a little bit more horizontally. This is the one they used to call a long time ago the lumbosacral ligament. So that's an AKA for the iliolumbar ligament, the lumbosacral ligament. Okay, uh, where you might be asking, where is the anterior and where's the posterior iliolumbar ligament? It's covered by this anterior sheet of thoracolumbar fascia, uh, which I said yesterday, it's been cut right here so we can see behind it. Behind it is the in clinically important quadratus lumborum. In fact, I think I have a picture, and we'll get more a little deeper into this thoracolumbar fascia later. But here's a bird's eye view, that axial, horizontal, or transverse, whatever AKA you feel like using. 
Here's that overhead view. There's the lumbar disc. There's the spinous transverse process. Uh, the quadratus lumborum is in green here. And you can see that it's completely encased uh, in this thoracolumbar fascia. The one, the anterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia is right here. And if we go back, let's see. Where was that picture? Oops. Am I going the wrong way? There it is. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's right here. That's the anterior thoracolumbar fascia. So it's also right here in the overhead view. Okay, the thoracolumbar fascia, an easy softball board question. Uh, the thoracolumbar fascia encases the psoas, major muscle. That's not true. It encases quadratus lumborum. Okay, it also helps uh, kind of surround the erector spinae uh, group as well, which we'll look at. Actually, you'll, you'll look at, they do that in lab. You'll get that, I think, second or third quarter. The palpation part of this course got pushed back to second, and I think it's going to be pushed back to third quarter pretty soon. Um, yeah, so Bogue Duke goes, just weighs in, and probably read Kramer's book, said there is no superior iliolumbar ligament. It's also confirmed by another researcher. We don't need to worry about that, but it's not just Bogue Duke who says that. Um, yeah, so the vertical and inferior iliolumbar ligaments are real. They deserve separate names. Uh, different looks. I said this yesterday, but the iliolumbar ligament is quite strange uh, in young people, especially in children. It's ac it's often muscular. It looks like a muscle. We had a cadaver where it was muscular uh, looking. I don't know if they showed you the iliolumbar ligament. I don't. I haven't looked at the new cadavers over there in a while. Um, but we had a young person. It was quite muscular looking. However, in your 40s, it starts to dry out, the muscle disappears, and it becomes a pure ligamentous structure. And then in older people, uh, it becomes, it, it degenerates to a f more of a fatty-like tissue, and it, then it can even calcify and turn into bone in some people. It's general function, what does this thing do? Uh, we've talked a little about spondylolisthesis and how the bones can slip on one another, and one of its big function is to present, uh, to prevent that slip, that forward slip, which is called forward slip is anterior sagittal translation. There's an anterior and posterior sagittal translation, but it's basically slipping the bone forward. It stops that. It it anchors L5 very tightly to the sacrum and prevents spondylolisthesis a.k.a. for spondylolisthesis, an anterolisthesis, which is a slipping forward. Um, and it also helps resist lateral bending, flexion, extension, and rotation. All right, let's take a closer look at this ligament. Uh, the anterior iliolumbar ligament is very well developed. All cadavers have it. Best seen from an A to P view. It's located behind the anterior fibers of thoracolumbar fascia uh, and quadratus lumborum. Um, so the anterior and posterior iliolumbar ligaments are basically covered, as we saw in that picture, by the anterior fibers of thoracolumbar fascia. So we have already said that. Where, what about origin and insertion? And in general, ligaments don't have an origin and insertion like muscles do, right? You're probably learning furiously right now the origin and insertion of upper extremity muscle. Or no, I guess you guys started probably in the lower extremities. Uh, but there's no origin and insertion. Um, they're just kind of arising points. So it arises from the anterior, so the front of the transverse process, and the bottom of the transverse process. And that means anterior inferior. See, there's anterior and there's inferior. Um, textbooks, even Netter, don't draw this ligament correctly. Um, they often draw it attached to L5 and L4. It is not attached to L4. That's thoracolumbar fascia, so that's a very common mistake in these books. It only arises from L5 normally. 
Um, and then where does it kind of connect to? You can call it inserts, but again, that's not an official insertion. Uh, but it, it inserts or connects to the adjacent iliac crest. So that's what it anchors into. And that's where you get transverse processes, part of the lumbar spine. L5 transverse process, part of the lumbar spine. That's where iliolumbar comes from. Um, it also inserts into quadratus lumborum as well. It's got some fibers sunk into that, just to give that a little support. Um, here is a nice overhead view again. You can see this is also, I presented this in the lab lecture. I don't think I had this on your worksheet, but if you watch that lab video I did, um, you can see this picture. And this is the anterior iliolumbar ligament right there. It's definitely a separate structure from the post here, which is not as well developed as the anterior. All right. Uh, the posterior, again, it's not as well developed. Um, it arises or comes from the tip of the posterior part of the transverse process. Um, does not, again, does not arise from L4 like it's erroneously drawn in many anatomy atlases. Nope, only from L5. And it also inserts into the iliac crest. We can see it rising right there from the posterior part of the transverse process, the tip more and it inserts right into the iliac crest, where the anterior one arises from the entire portion of the transverse process. If the bone tries to slip forward, right, this is forward, this is backwards, there's the lamina, it's minus process would be back here. If it tries to slip forward, both of these ligaments are going to hang on to it and help uh, with, with reducing the amount of slip. So you can see how that works. All right, the inferior iliolumbar ligament, that's one that heads downward. It's a little more horizontal than the vertical fibers. This, again, remember the old AKA for this is lumbosacral ligament because some professors still use that and it could even show up on boards. Um, it arises from the medial inferior border of the transverse process. So it's very close to the vertebra body. and In fact, it spills over onto the vertebral body. Fibers pass obliquely downward over the anterior sacroiliac ligament. We've seen that before. There's a picture of it. Right, so there's where it arises from. Right here, vertebral body, uh, more the medial part of the transverse process, passes over the sacroiliac, anterior sacroiliac ligament, uh, and it attaches into the, the iliac crest here or the sacral ally, actually, actually. Or this is where the confusion, see the angry face. This is where the confusion comes. Um, it inserts into the iliac fossa, according to Boak Duke, and most authors that I've read. Kramer says it inserts into the sacral ally. Um, so that's, that's a big difference, right? Those are two separate bones. So hopefully when they're doing board questions, the professors will know to leave this question alone because there's conflict between Boak Duke uh, and Kramer. All right, so we're going with Boak Duke. He inserts into this, the ala here of the, or the iliac fossa. What is the ala of the ilium, by the way? Because the back of this, what's the back side of this called? Good, somebody was thinking at the gluteal surface. Right? So what's the whole thing called? The gluteal surface and the front side here. That's called the ala of the coxal bone or the ala of the ilium. Just like wing, just like the ala of the sacrum right here. Uh, okay. And oh yeah, so now I can get you with the same picture. I can get you in lab and I can get you in lecture. And we've already went over that, so I don't need to do that again. What about the vertical fibers? This is clini very clinically important here. Uh, the vertical fibers, they arise from the anterior inferior border of L5 transverse process. Okay. Uh, and they descend all the way down to something called the iliopectineal line. This, this description is old. It's really the arcuate line. Uh, that I don't 
not sure if that's still on your list, uh, but I think pectin pubis, remember you have the, um, the pectin pubis, the pubic tubercle. I always used to say the pubic tubercle is like a volcano, and then you get these lava flows. And one of the lava flows kind of posteriorly is the pectin pubis. And then that morphs into something called the, the iliopubic eminence, which is a bump. And then that morphs into the arcuate line. The arcuate line dumps into our friend uh, the auricular surface of the ilium. So it's a continuous flow of lava. Together, all those lines are called the iliopectineal line, not a line. Okay, so it inserts. It goes quite a ways, the bottom line is. Um, yeah, so you can see it here. Uh, it's going over the sacrum, and it's going, I mean, some of them go all the way down. Uh, the arcuate line would be running right in here. I guess I should have put a picture of a coxal bone up. I'll try to make a note to do that next time. Um, yeah, and then Kramer doesn't even recognize it. He doesn't even talk about these vertical fibers, which is too bad because they are clinically important, as we'll see here in a second. Um, there is a common trunk. The vertical inferior iliolumbar ligament do kind of morph together as they move toward the lumbar spine. Uh, but it is clinically important because it makes uh, a kind of a makeshift foramen for the lumbosacral trunk. And lumbosacral trunk, of course, is L4 and L5 ventral ramus. Um, very similar to, remember the lateral sacral coccygeal ligament? how it made a makeshift hole uh, for the ventral ramus of L5. It's kind of the same, the same deal here. So let's take a look at that. So here's the common trunk of these kind of inferior running fibers. Um, but this, these vertical fibers right here, you can see they make the lateral margin of this makeshift hole. If you take the ligaments away, there's no hole here. Uh, but L5 and L4, which form, they come together, sometimes in the hole, sometimes down further. That's the lateral sacral trunk, or the lumbosacral trunk, and that's super clinically important. You're going to treat patients every month with inflammation of that nerve, which causes sciatica. And once in a blue moon, you can get a calcification of this ligament, and you can get bone spurs sticking off and stabbing. Uh, that lumbosacral trunk, and it's a rare cause of sciatica. In my practice, I've seen, um, I've seen patients with this before. Some people call it the far out syndrome, because it's kind of a compression away from the usual places. All right, so everybody good with that? Um, there's another picture here. Um, yep, just showing the the common trunk here of the inferior and vertical lumbar ligaments. Uh, running here. The one most and clinically important though, again, um, those are the vertical, those are the vertical fibers, which are running more vertical than the inferior fibers. All right, I think we talked about that already, the arcuate line, okay. But this is the lumbosacral trunk. Uh, so L5 ventral ramus uh, meets the L4 ventral ramus they come together to form the very important lumbosacral trunk. And if you haven't seen that yet, you'll definitely see that next quarter. Okay, so another important thing of this common trunk that can occur. Uh, in about 3% of humans, there's a, a new band of tissue that's not supposed to be there. If we go back to this, See, there's no tissue running over to the ala of the sacrum. There's no tissue coming off this medially. But in about 3% of humans, we have this weird anomalous medial fibers. They're just called the medial fibers of the inferior iliolumbar ligament. Or that would be of the vertical iliolumbar ligament. Right, that shouldn't be inferior, it should be in uh, vertical because the vertical fibers are the ones more medial here. Uh, but the bottom line, there can be an anomalous band here uh, that comes off the iliolumbar ligament, and it really makes a tight squeeze here because there's already a hole here, right? 
we, we saw in this picture, there's already a hole here. So now if you have fibers running across like this, can I draw? I, I should have turned on my drawing tools. I could have probably drawn, but I don't want to mess up the recording. Uh, but you can see it can really squeeze this hole right here. So a uh, cause of far out syndrome, rare cause. Thought to be another rare, very rare cause of lower extremity radicular pain. Remember, uh, lay people call it sciatica, pain down. Remember, radicular pain is a pain that, uh, and it, it doesn't have to run all the way down the leg. I have clients, it's just in the foot. Some people, it's in the calf. Some people, it's only in the thigh. Some people, it's in the foot and the thigh. Some people, it's in the calf and the butt. It can be variable. Uh, but if it follows a fairly narrow band, like if it's on the front of your thigh, maybe a little the side of your thigh, you call it radicular pain. If the entire leg is affected, that's not radicular pain. That's probably neuropathic pain. And you'll get that more as you go through the program. All right. Posterior sacroiliac ligament, we said, and you know this from gross one, there are long fibers and short fibers of the posterior sacroiliac ligament. Let's take a look at them. So here's the long fibers in green. We did this yesterday. And there's the more horizontal short posterior iliac ligament uh, in yellow. Okay, so where do they arise from? Where do they take off from? Now this is why I taught you all these mountain ranges. Uh, the long posterior sacroiliac ligament arises from our friend, the intermediate sacral crest and the lateral sacral crest uh, of S3 and S4. See, now you know why we had to learn those structures. Uh, it courses superior laterally. So superior means it courses up. Laterally means it courses kind of out to the side, and kind of in an oblique fashion. Uh, and it inserts into the inferior portion of the posterior superior iliac spine, better known as the PSIS. These fibers do blend in with the medial fibers of the sacrotuberous ligament, as we'll see here in a second. Well, we can see them right there because there's the sacrotuberous ligament. Those are the superior fibers, and they do blend in together here. Sometimes it's difficult to see. I remember when we prepared cadavers, sometimes we had to kind of cut these apart so you could see the long fibers better. All right, but there they are, and it's inserted intermediate sacral crest, lateral sacral crest, S2 or S3 and S4. All right, who cares about this ligament? Well, there's some several important structures that attach to the ligament. I can see the question now, can't you? All of the following except blank attach to the post to the long fibers of the posterior sacroiliac ligament. And so uh, the gluteus maximus does. Some of the deep fascia of the gluteus maximus attaches to it. Uh, the posterior thoracolumbar fascia attaches to it. The erector spiny muscle, the aponeurosa, which is similar to a fascia, maybe a little tougher, uh, that attaches to it. Uh, and then some of the sacral or uh, some of the multifidi muscles, well, the deep fascia of the sacral attachments of the caudalmost multifidi muscle. Uh, so what attaches to it? Gluteus maximus, thoracolumbar fascia, posterior fibers, erector spinae, multifidi. So really, I should have had star. I've asked that before. I should have had some stars on that slide. So you can put some stars on that slide. What does the thing do? What's the function of this ligament? Um, well, it helps or limits a backwards rocking motion. And we, we learned that that rocking motion of the SI joint is called nutational motion. And now we can kind of expand on that definition a little bit. Um, some people call a backwards rocking, uh, you, I called it posterior nutational motion, but some people call it counter nutation. So there's a forward rocking, the anterior sagittal nutation was the forward rocking. Um, that's just called nutation. Backwards rocking, counter nutation. All right, we talked about that before. Um, so uh, 
if you can use the sacrum. The, you could use these too. It doesn't matter which one you use. Um, but if you rock the ilium forward or you rock the sacrum forward, that's called nutation or anterior sagittal nutation or just anterior nutation. Uh, if you rock the coxal bone posteriorly, uh, that's called counter nutation or posterior nutation or posterior sagittal nutation. I should have brought my water over by me too. I don't have my mask on. It feels wonderful to lecture without a mask. I should be drinking my water though. Um, okay, so that's the story with that. And just another picture. So rocking forward, nutation, rocking backwards, counter nutation. Always use the top of the sacrum uh, or the top of the iliac crest to describe your rotation. Right? Because if we rock the top of the sacrum forward, we're rocking the bottom of the sacrum backwards. So you always use the top of the sacrum or the top of the coxal bone to describe nutation. All right, short posterior sacroiliac ligament. It also arises from those same intermediate and lateral sacral crests, not from S3 or S4, though. Um, this one arises from S2 and S1. The fibers run more horizontally compared to the long posterior sacroiliac ligament, as we've seen, and they insert into the iliac crest, specifically the medial lip of the iliac crest. Okay. Um, and then they also insert into the uh, posterior superior iliac spine, the PSIS. Right, and we've seen it before. See, there's that intermediate sacral crest here. You can see they all attach, but these are one and two. And the long fibers are three and four. They both insert into the PSS, inferior PSS, more the lateral PSS. And these actually extend into the uh, sick, uh, into the inter, inner lip of the iliac crest. Okay, what does it do? In concert, it, it supports the function of the inner osteosacroiliac ligaments. Uh, so it does help bind the sacrum to the ilium. Um, and it helps prevent something called sacroiliac diastasis. Uh, and that is just a slip of the SI joint. So instead of the nutational motion, because right now we're rocking around that Bonier's tubercle and Bonier's fossa, what if you just drove the sacrum straight forward? No, no rotation. You just drove it straight forward. That's a diastasis. That's a slip. That can happen to people during birth sometimes. You can get a slip here uh, of the uh, the pubic of the uh, symphys pubis. Is normally together in pregnancy you have to push a baby through here sometimes you can get a misalignment um, of the pubis bone here and that's also called a diastasis and I'm sure you'll get that more as you go through and let's hit the sacral tuberous ligaments now this is gross one anatomy so I'm not going to get it too hard but uh, remember sacral tuberous ligament. And why do I care about this? Why am I going so deep into this? This There's a chiropractic technique called sacral occipital technique, or SOT, uh, that uses this ligament all the time. Uh, you hook your fingers in there, and you push it and pull it different ways, and you stretch it, and there's all kinds of treatment you can do with this for people with pelvic pain and low back pain in rare cases. Uh, so it's a very clinically important ligament, so we really should know. That's made up of two different fibers. It's made up of these oblique fibers that are yellow here. Um, and then it's made up of a group of fibers that run superiorly, called the superior fibers. It's still sacral. To, remember sacrum to the ischial tuberosity, sacral tuberous ligament? Uh, they're still sacral tuberous ligament. Uh, but, I mean, technically it's not. It's connecting coxal bone to coxal bone or ischium to ilium. Uh, but there are two distinct fiber bands in here. Okay, um, they arise. The superior fibers arise in the lateral lip of the iliac crest. Let's see that. Oh, there's the iliac crest. Here's the lateral lip. There's the medial lip. 
so they arise right there. Uh, maybe the latter part of the PSIS. They run all the way down uh, and they insert into the ischial tuberosity, kind of the lateral part of the ischial tuberosity. They do make a very strong tendon. It's impossible to get these fibers apart here. Um, and uh, they form a common tendon that really inserts into this, um, this tubercle. Let's see, did I miss something? No, so those are the superior fibers, rise from the lateral lip. Um, and inferior lateral PSIS, and yep. And some fibers arise from the posterior inferior, yeah, we said that right, okay. Uh, the course, they course, what does that mean, course? That means they travel, they travel inferiorly, and they blend, blend in with the lateral part of the oblique fibers down here to form a common trunk. Uh, and the common trunk inserts into the issue tuberosity down there. Right? The oblique fibers, these are the ones that you've probably seen more. Um, they arise from the lateral sacral crest, not the intermediate sacral crest, like the posterior sacroiliac ligaments do, but just the lateral sacral crest, way down low, maybe S5, maybe S4 too. Uh, and uh, they the lateral margins of the lower sacrum, the very lower part of the sacrum, maybe even the coccyx they come off of. And they move inferior laterally and converge with the vertical fiber or uh, the superior fibers that should be right there uh, to form the common tendon, as we said, and insert into the issue of tuberosity. By the way, you can see we're not taking a break. I'll just go right through this and be done with it. All right, and I'll stick around for questions after if you have questions. Uh, sacral spinous ligament, take a look at that. Um, so this one arises from the, let's take a look at it, sacrum to the spine. The spine means ischial, spine of the ischium. See, there's the ischial spine. So sacrum to the spine, ischial spine, sacral spinous ligament. Um, so it arises from the costal elements or the bone bars and the lateral mass of the anterior sacrum. Remember lateral mass, that, those are made of transverse process elements. That's the lateral part of the sacrum uh, of, of S2, S3, and S4 sacral segments. Let's take a look at it, see if they drew it right. No, they didn't draw it right. They could have, this probably goes up a little bit higher than this, but there it is, nevertheless. Uh, it courses more horizontally, inserts into the spine of the ischium. Uh, it's, it's claim to fame, or the question will probably come, not so much from the insertions. Uh, although they could ask you where they insert. Uh, but what does it form? It, and it forms the inferior border of the greater sciatic foramen. Let's, let's see if we can see that. Um, so here it is. Sure enough, it's, here's the greater sciatic foramen, and it does form the floor of the great exciter, uh, greater, greater sciatic foramen, um, and the medial wall is formed more by the sacrotuberous ligament here, the oblique fibers in particular. Okay, what does it do? What's its function? It anchors the inferior sacrum to the ischium. Can we see that? Yeah. It anchors, there's the sacrum, so it stabilizes the sacrum with the, uh, with the coxal bones, basically. All right, um, and yeah, so greater, I'll take a time out here for a greater, a little rabbit hole. Greater and lesser sciatic foramen are so clinically important. I know this you have, or you have this in gross one. Um, but you, uh, you need to know what forms these foramen. Um, so they're formed by the superior tubers or the sacral tuberous ligament, sacral spinous ligament, greater sciatic notch. Remember, this is the bony notch. The greater sciatic notch is made of bone, and the lesser sciatic notch form the greater sciatic foramen and lesser sciatic foramen. Uh, and professors love to ask you, just like I did in lab, what comes out of those holes? So what comes out of that greater sciatic foramen? Piriformis. The gluteal, superior and inferior gluteal nerves. 
the mighty sciatic nerve, the small sciatic nerve, which is kind of its nickname, that's the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, uh, the internal pudendal artery and vein, uh, nerve to the obturator internus, and nerve to quadratus femoris are the kind of maybe not so terribly important ones, but the ones that are in red are very important. Um, these are gluteal nerves are important too. What comes out of the lesser sciatic foramen? Uh, the pudendal nerve. Notice the pudendal nerve. It comes out of the greater sciatic foramen, runs in Alcox canal, and dives back into the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen. That's a famous kind of board type question. Pudendal nerve is a very strange course. Comes out of the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen, runs in Alcox Canal for a ways, and then dives back into the pelvis uh, through the lesser sciatic foramen. So that's weird. I like to ask that question. Um, and then the internal pudendal vessels uh, also go this pathway. They follow, pretty much follow, at least for a while they follow the pudendal nerve. Nerve to the obturator internus. All right, there's just another picture of lesser sciatic foramen and greater sciatic foramen. Uh, sacrotuberous ligament and the sacrospinous ligament. What do they do together? They help limit that tiny bit of nutational and counter nutational motion. Uh, so they basically just stabilize the coxal bone to the sacrum. All right, so let's just start this new topic. I guess I probably could have stopped right here, but let's just do a little bit more. Uh, diseases of the SI joint is always important. Um, kind of getting away from anatomy just a tiny bit, but I do. I am a pathology professor, so I do love my clinical pathology. So let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, so. Degeneration. Everybody's heard of arthritis. That's a form of degeneration of the bone, the joint capsule, the articular cartilage. Dries up, gets brittle. Sometimes it becomes unstable as it dries up and the ligaments get relaxed and you get bone spurs and such. But everybody gets that. So there's some degeneration is just part of getting old. That's called age-related degeneration. But then there's degeneration that I see in people your age. In fact, I had a 14-year-old whose spine looked like a 50-year-old's, just full of herniations and degenerative disc disease. And, uh, there is a pathological, that's a pathological degeneration. It's not normal. And we'll look at some of the causes of that pathological degeneration. But natural age-related degeneration, um, it's just part of life. In fact, the human is so good at degenerating that you can predict the age of the human by the amount of degeneration uh, in the sacroiliac joints is a good place where forensic pathologists uh, they they can use that to to identify remains um, but yeah everybody goes through degeneration and uh, this age-related degeneration it's usually associated with some aches and pains but nothing major nothing bad enough to make you miss work or anything like that, but it, it can be used, and not only just the sacroiliac joints, but other joints can be used to predict the age uh, of the human skeleton. Now, what about the things that are pathological and can cause pain? You're going to run into these in practice. First one we'll talk about is pathological degeneration. And as I said, the human can sometimes suffer an accelerated form of degeneration, uh, which causes an inflammation, degenerates tissues, uh, causes extra bone to be laid down. That's called osteoarthritis, and maybe the body's attempt to kind of make up for the ligaments that have gotten really weak and degenerated. And there's a whole bunch of AKAs for arthritis. Uh, if it's in the bone, it's osteoarthritis. So OA, osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis. Uh, just arthritis, degenerative joint disease, or DJD. Those are all degenerations and really a pathological degeneration of the bony joint. And it does it can include the cartilage and ligaments around the joint. <coughs> Excuse me, as well. I'm doing much better, aren't I? I'm not coughing nearly as much. Um, 
Yeah, but this can definitely result in chronic pain, both low back pain and SI joint pain in the vicinity of the PSIS. Let's look at a normal. I know we did this last time, but I really want you to get used to looking at these radiographs. There's a, a to, or PA view or A to P. It's hard to tell which way it is of the uh, lumbosacral joint. Uh, you can see the lumbar vertebrae here. You can see the transverse processes. You might have to hallucinate them a little. And no, there's no connection there. It looks like there's a connection, but remember this an x-ray is like being run over with a steamroller. Everything is superimposed upon one another. Spinous process you can see right here. Lamina here and here. Um, you can also see, anybody take a guess what this is? If you know, leave your leave a comment down there in the in the chat. Let's see who the radiologist of the day is. The little eyes, right? There's a nose, and there's two eyes. And there's kind of a sad face. It's the bottom of the lamina. You always look for these eyes. And why is this eye? How come this one is? This is a normal one. Why is it more white, and this eye not so white? It's because of these little blobs right here. See the black blob? What in the world is that? That is gas, right? That's gas that comes out at sometimes the wrong time. Um, gas lets photons zip through tissue. Uh, so it, the photons that pass through gas, um, they, hit the, they hit the film or they hit the plate and it makes it uh, the, the area more dark. So we have some gas right here is the trouble, and it makes the pedicle look darker. So that's not osteolytic cancer or anything. Uh, there, here's the sacrum. There's the base of the sacrum. There's S1 tubercle. There's the S2. Right? You can see the anterior sacral foramen here. We talked about this weird-looking SI joint, didn't we? Why is it so weird-looking? Well, because those SI joints are angled at 30 degrees. So we're, and we said everything gets smashed flat, so we're seeing different depths of the SI joint. Maybe this is more posterior, this part is more anterior. Uh, but the key is, is to look for any type of sclerosis, any bony whitening, extra bone degeneration uh, usually is associated with a lot of white extra bone being laid down here as the body's attempt to snuff out inflammation that's chronic or stabilize a joint that's gotten loose. We don't see any there. That's a really nice looking joint. There's no crazy whiteness there. Now let's look at the next one. So here's a 47 year old who suffers chronic low back pain. And do, do lay people know the difference between low back pain and SI joint pain? They don't know the difference between that. Uh, so that this person had pain more in his SI joint than in the low back. Um, but if you look at the SI joints, look at the sclerosis. Uh, look at the, that's called sclerosis. Look at the whiteness around here, right? So that's severe type of degeneration. And there, it could be from ankylosing spondylitis. It could be a sacroiliac, or sacroiliitis. There's a bunch of things that can cause it. It could be just from wear and tear arthritis, which uh, was the case here. So that's called sclerosis. Um, and yeah, so those D joints are, are quite, quite degenerated. Compare that to that, right? There's no bony sclerosis. Or there, these, this is very radio-opaque. That's another term you'll use, you'll use in radiology. Radio-opaque is white. Radiolucent is black, darker in color. All right. Um, and yeah, this degeneration phenomenon is not just in the lumbar or in the sacrum or SI joint. It could be in the lumbar spine as well. Look at this normal. This is like a 30-year-old. And you can see it's a lateral view. You can see the sacrum. You can see the linear transverse array uh, where the remnant of the disc is still there. You, ca you can't see the disc on radiograph, but you can certainly see where its shadow is. It's right here. 
Uh, it's right here. Those are called the disk spaces. L5 looks beautiful. L4, L3. You can hallucinate the spinous process here. See that? You can see the facets. We'll get the, into this next week. Superior articular process is right here. Inferior articular process. There's the facet joint or the Z joint or the zygapotheseal joint, whatever you want to call it. I guess we should call it zygapotheseal joint. Yeah, I don't see a lot of bony sclerosis. Do you? Not any. Now, where there's pressure, where bones rub a lot and there's a lot of force going through bones, it's normal for them to get a little bit white. Uh, so this is normal. But now let's look at this patient of mine a couple of years ago. Chronic low back pain, failed chiropractic, failed physical therapy, failed everything. Um, and what do you see? What do you think of this mess? Well, it's a mess. Uh, look at all the white bony sclerosis. Where have the discs went? Right? They're bone on bone. This is this is grade five degenerative disc disease right here. Bone on bone. Uh, there's a Furman classification system. It's a grade five Furman. Uh, at both levels. Um, and there's a little disc left up here at L3. But look at the giant points of bone coming off here. Those are called bone spurs. Uh, and at one time, and this guy's had back pain all his life, um, at one time this tells me that the L4 and L5 were unstable. They were slipping back and forth and the body recognizes that and tries to fix it by growing these big points of bone stabilizing the segment. What else is the problem? Let's go for the radiologist of the day. What else does this person have? A huge problem with regard to alignment. So I'll go read your comments here in a second. We're almost done. Somebody get it? Where's the back corner of this bone? It's right there. Where's the back corner of S1? Well here's the sacral canal. There's the back corner of S1 here, back corner of L5. So this is a, a grade 2 spondylolisthesis. 25% slip forward is a grade 1. If it goes past 25, it's a grade 2. If it goes past 50, it's a grade 3. It's darn near grade 3. All right, so that's an example of, of a degenerative spondylolisthesis. Or this is a, you can see the fracture right here. This is the ismic spondylolisthesis. Uh, which the patient's had for many years, and the body's tried to do its best to stabilize it. It's trying to grow it together here as well. And, yep, that's what you're going to run in out there. Uh, where does where do most people feel, back to the SI joint, uh, where does the research say that most people feel SI joint pain? We said it can be referred into the thigh sometimes, but with the SI joint, that's a chronic source of pain, it's usually right over the SI joint, right over the PSISs. Although sometimes it can be referred to the posterior lateral thigh, lateral thigh, or even the anterior lateral thigh, can be referred. But they're going to have, if they don't have pain here, it's not an SI joint problem in my uh, experience. It's not going to refer pain without there being pain in the original pain generator. What are the causes of pathological degeneration? Uh, well, like that, that young, that young teenager who has a spine like a 40, 50 year old. Bad genetics. Uh, they just, the genes that make collagen, type 1 collagen, are mutated and they make a substandard type of collagen which just can't stand up good and then the body tries to, to degenerate it to, to try to stabilize it. Uh, physical demanding occupation or physically demanding occupations like a dock worker, a cowboy, a professional skateboarder, um, they get beat up, their spines get beat up, football player. People with biomechanical abnormalities such as an unequal leg length, that's one of your jobs is to check a, one of your new patients and make sure their legs are straight for goodness sakes. Uh, primary docs will never do that. Um, yeah, if you've got a leg that's an inch and a half longer than the other, that patient's headed for pain. Uh, you need to fix that with a heel lift or orthotic or something. Um, and trauma, sacroiliac joint trauma can do it. Uh, and idiopathic, what's that mean again? That means we don't know what the cause is. 
just happens. Um, what kind of trauma can cause an SI joint? I think we're almost done here. Um, axial load injury, so a slip and fall right on the buttocks. That can rip up the SI joints. A broadside MVA. What's an MVA? Not an MBA. Uh, that's a motor vehicle accident. So broadside means you get hit in the passenger door or the driver's side door. You get hit from the side. Um, that'll rip up the SI joints. They don't like that. Um, or an uneven axial load injury is even worse. You're walking in the dark. It's been raining. There's puddles on the sidewalk. And you step in a puddle, but it's not really a puddle. It's, well, it's a deep puddle, uh, and it's a hole in the sidewalk, and you go down four or five inches. Um, that will mess up your SI joints as well. They don't like that type of trauma. All right, so that is it. Let me shut down the shop, and I'll come back to the chat and see if you have any questions. Otherwise, we will see you all next week.